We've got a problem, a big one. Water chip broke. Human bodies are 60% water. No water, no vault. We have 150 days to find a spare water chip. If we fail, the game is over. Well, let's not fail then. Here's our fact sheet. Fallout was made in 1997. That's a year before Baldur's Gate and a decade before Mass Effect. The game is both very influential and tragically misunderstood. Influential because it inspired a great number of RPG philosophies, we'll talk about some of them, and misunderstood because its gameplay formula is not replicated often. There are few authentic Fallout likes. Anyway, the reason it's called Fallout 1 is because it only has one build, the agility build. There is no reason not to have 9 or 10 points in agility unless you are intentionally making the game harder. Charisma is not very important in Fallout 1 because it doesn't determine the companion limit, and the companions themselves are mechanically and narratively weak. Unfortunately, the game doesn't have much in a way of unarmed exclusive content. It's a viable, but a boring way to play. Elite Gamer Tip If you let the enemy initiate combat, you'll get to move twice in a row. Use this knowledge to blast the tutorial rats extra hard. To the west, you see natural light. For the first time in your life, you see the outside world. The Overseer marked our map with the location of another vault. That's where we should go. On our way to Vault 15, we stumble upon a village in the wasteland. Hi! I heard there was a traveler in town, but I was kind of skeptical until I saw you. My name's Tandy, what's yours? Welcome to Shady Sands, stranger. Please holster your weapon while you are here. Stone buildings, no roads, few comforts. So far, the wasteland community fails to impress a sophisticated vault dweller. Did they gack malfunction or something? Finally, someone else who sees! Of course, you've probably been everywhere. Tandy so. has quite a political career ahead of her, but that's decades from now. It feels weird to think that she used to be hot. It's like looking at pictures of Jan Hillary. You know, it's different today, but back in the late 90s, when exposed to the aesthetic of Fallout, the first word that came to mind was realism. Compared to the contemporary RPGs, this game was very grounded, both in terms of its visuals and world-building. Wizardry was about chasing Dark Savant's black ship with a cyber Valkyrie GF and an army of anthropomorphic rhinoceri. Fallout was about real people with real problems. If our character was efficient in science, we could have told the farmer about the concept of crop rotation and help the community that way. But even without points in science, it's still possible to do that by using the Tell Me About feature. Fallout inherited it from Wasteland, where communication was prompt-based. The feature was removed in the sequel. None of the subsequent games have it. You can use it to ask a question or to communicate things to an NPC. Kinda stupid, kinda cool. The Brahma pens are north. Although the smell Notice he says Brahma, not Brahmin. A regional dialect. These losers are the Shady Sands Self-Defense Militia. The NCR military history begins here. The guy in the leather jacket is Ian, our first companion. The follower system and their personalities are rudimentary. Fallout 1 can't be played as a party-based game. But Fallout 2 can. That game has two builds. That's the name, I guess. It's time we bring back that ancient debate. What is better, Fallout 1 or Fallout 2? Today we'll decide once and for all. And right away, the second game gets a point for having twice as many builds. The CRPG excellence. But enough distractions, we have a job to do. Me? Leave? I wish. I don't know enough to leave alone. No one else wants to go. Worst of all, my father says he would have a heart attack if something happened to me. Vault 15 and its consequences have been a disaster for California. The population was a mix of radically diverse ideologies. The subsequent conflicts led to the emergence of several violent raider societies and a somewhat progressive village of Shady Sands that will eventually become NCR. Basically, Fallout predicted something awful. Manifesting the spirit of Vault 15, our companion Ian breaks the game by getting stuck in a doorframe. You can't push NPCs out of the way in Fallout Fallout 1, so I had to reload a save. There is something called Fallout at 2, which is an engine conversion that brings the functionality of Fallout 2 into the first game, including the ability to push away NPCs. 
The vault command and control is buried under rubble. We'll have to look for the water chip elsewhere. Well, I never thought it's gonna be easy. Take this spear. It was found where my daughter was last seen. Seth and I believe one of the raider clans is responsible. Thank Dharma you're here, Wanderer. My girl, uh, Tandy, has been kidnapped, says the gate guard. The Wasteland Raiders' base is less than a day away. Meet the Khans, one of the raider gangs that emerged from Vault 15. I love the music track. What do you offer for her release? Asks the leader of the raiders. It might be good for your eternal soul, says the Vault Dweller. But Garl Deathhand is not a spiritual man. Well, what's your plan? Duck and cover. That's your plan? The 10mm submachine gun can handle any early game threat no problem. Fallout 1 is reasonably generous with equipment. This is where Ian fell, an ex-mercenary from the Crimson Caravan who stayed in Shady Sands because the locals were nice to him. Never speak ill of the dead and all that, but he really isn't very useful past this point anyway. Tandy joins us as a temporary companion. She will never leave until you go back to the village. You can take her on a tour of the wasteland if you want. Oh, that was great! Action! Adventure! Anyway... If there's anything that I can do for you... There is a dialogue option to attempt to solicit sexual favors from Tandy, but that won't work. She only f***s cops. May the water you find in the desert not shine at you in the dark. Fraternal assistance to the brotherly people. The existence and the relative prosperity of Shady Sands kinda defangs the game's promise, doesn't it? The locals are friendly enough. There is no reason for the story to end should the vault run out of drinking water. We can just move in with these guys. There is a Polish fan game called V13 that uh, briefly explores a similar idea. Our vault has 133 days of water left. The search for the chip continues. We looted all sorts of garbage from the raiders, and now we need to find someone to sell it to. Cause, uh, one person's junk is another per- Segway. Get your butt in here and sit down. We got some business to discuss. A medium-sized town surrounded by a wall of wrecked cars. That's the description provided by the info box. But how do we even know what a medium-sized town is? We've only been in, like, two places. The location design is sometimes viewed as one of the strengths of Fallout 1 compared to the sequel. No stupid-ass talking Deathclaw vault in this one. And you know what? That's fair. But the first game has problems as well. It feels like the developers didn't quite figure out the best mapping practices yet. This is especially noticeable in Shady Sands and here in Junktown. It is as if there is a layer of detail missing. The buildings are way too far apart, making the maps annoying to navigate, visually boring and frankly irrational. These are walled settlements. Real estate should be precious. In comparison, the Fallout 2 maps are more detailed, but not too detailed so that they would be annoying to read. Another point for the glorious sequel. Killian Darkwater's General Store. We got about everything you can need. Talking to Killian triggers a cutscene. The world's smartest assassin walks in alone, declares his intention to murder our host, and then promptly gets ventilated by Killian's three guards. I know Gizmo's behind this. The mayor is a due process kind of person, so we need to obtain proofs to convince the people of Junktown that Gizmo is up to no good. And here is our second companion, Dogmeat, the original. His owner passed away. The dog is depressed and and now it wages a one canine war on random residents of Junktown. Gizmo is represented by a unique sprite, so clearly he's important. He also can't move, so mechanically speaking, the table is a part of his body. I don't take kindly to strangers walking into my office and accusing me. There are two ways of getting the evidence. You can either plant a bug on him with the steel skill or make him confess via a speech check. Before we finalize this, we should get the most useful human companion in the game. Tycho is a desert ranger. Yeah, one of those. Came here all the way from Nevada. Lead on, my friend, and let's do some street sweeping. I recommend knocking over Gizmo, if I may. Your wish is my command. Dogmeat bites the table, damaging Gizmo for four hit points. More like jank town, am I right? A unique death animation to celebrate a problem solved. 
What you do in this game is go from place to place and solve ethical problems. The Junktown affair is sometimes presented as a unit of Fallout. Let's talk about some of the conversations this game launched. Choices and consequences. This happens again and again. Individuals isolate one of the ideas of Fallout, they fall in love with it, they develop an entire philosophy from it, and then they create a game based on this philosophy. The Age of Decadence. The term choices and consequences was never properly defined, and through the ebbs and flows of the discourse, it eventually came to mean a type of design where you fork a story by selecting an option in dialogue. The Age of Decadence is one of my favorite games of all time, but a Fallout grog might say that, uh, strictly speaking, it's a very elaborate misunderstanding of Fallout. And that might be true, but so what? Are you gonna call the philosophy cops about it? Narc. Choices and consequences. I give this idea an 8 out of 10 rating. Now, if you were a forums poster in the mid 2000s, chances are you were a believer in the ideology of system supremacy. The most important part of an RPG is its roly play system. The more thaco we put into this thing, the more of an RPG it is. This made a lot of sense back then. The RPGs produced during that era lost much of their mechanical complexity, and predictably, this created resentment, followed by project test and posting. This guy's name is Jacques Derrida. To my knowledge, he didn't play CRPGs, but he wrote a lot of books. Derrida was very upset that people around him seemed to prioritize speech over writing, the spoken word over written word. I don't think we have this problem in the age of smartphone and social media, but things were different in Derrida's time, and this annoyed him a great deal. In the system supremacy theory, individuals would prioritize the RPG in CRPG. Visual art, music, Music, voice acting. Sure, you can have that, I mean, if you must, but the heart of the experience is its systems and formulas. The ambassador of these ideas is a controversial CRPG sword flight created using the Neverwinter 1 toolset. It's controversial because of its high difficulty. Sword flight is cleverly balanced around the use of consumables. It's a very good game, but there is a problem with sword flight. It's the world's biggest sewer level. The first two installments include dozens of hours of sewer adventure, and even the outdoor segments are designed to be maze-like and sewery so that they don't violate the theme, I guess. I should have known. When I saw Lilura evangelizing the virtues of sword flight to an audience of zero people on the game FAQ's message boards, I should have known something was up. I give the systems theory 8 out of 10 points. Basically, Lura f***ing everyone in the ass again. 125 days. The hub is a major trading center in the wasteland. It's bigger than all the previous locations combined. But the people of the hub had no life, and it was a desolate place just the same. Spare change, old friend, old pal. Can you help a poor mutant down on his luck? Sides to see. The bookstore. This is where you convert bottle caps into skill points in the science, repair, and other skills. An important money sink. Jacob the Trader used to be in the Union of Atomic Workers, a brotherhood of steel-like faction wiped out by mutants years ago. The organization is never mentioned again, and its purpose is to explain why he has so much advanced technology in stock. This is the first time we see a heavy weapon. The Fargo traders have a problem. Their caravans keep disappearing. Some say it's the Deathclaw. The Hound of Bakersfield. The Deathclaw is the most evil thing to rise out of the ashes after the war. Some say it's a ghost that haunts the land. It's no ghost. Harold the Merchant saw it with his own eye. Ooh, that thing. Friend, that is Nightmare City. Why the hell are you asking about that? Gonna kill it! Our first Deathclaw. And the unconscious body next to it is our first super mutant. The creature is an HP brick. It's fast and deals a ton of damage. We are armed with baby weapons. Typically in a situation like this, you want to go for the eyes. But there is a problem with that. I can't look at him. It is said the Deathclaw can hypnotize just by looking. Then it walks up and boom! You're it. It's nothing as dramatic, but I wasn't able to blind the creature this way. So I shot it in the leg instead. That works. 
Dogmeat landed the final blow. The canine is already more useful than Ian, may God rest his soul. The super mutant is not long for this world either. The creature is incoherent. Father, where are you, father? Yes, master. The holodisc found on the body reveals that the mutant was part of some sort of a spec ops team that hunts caravans and kidnaps humans. The Deathclaw was innocent. How do you 120 days. That's the Maltese Falcon, the Wasteland Mafia Den. There's a certain merchant who's... how to phrase this... not cooperating fully with the underground. Decker the Crime Man heard about our adventures in Junktown, and he hires us on the spot. The Gangster Quest line gives us a reason to explore some of the side areas of the hub, like the upper class district. You can snipe the merchant from this window here. You see, the last job I gave you was a test. The mafioso will then ask the Vault Dweller to kill the High Priestess Jane of the Children of the Cathedral, a humanitarian organization from L.A. They operate a hospital in the Water Merchants District, a very uh, strange hospital. The patients are lying on the floor and babbling incoherently about Holy Flame. Have you studied the sacraments, child? Y yes Then you should know high elders of the cathedral do not just hand out blessings. It's not my job to educate you. We can get a lot more out of this character by using the Ask Me About feature. Tell me, Jane, who is the master? There is no master but the Holy Flame. He is our master. He is the master of all. What do you know about mutants? They are holy. For they bear marks of past sins for present witnesses. Past sins? Like the war? The inattention by those who came before caused the holy fires. It was justice. The characters in this game don't have a lot of dialogue. Fallout 1 is praised for its concise writing. But if you are intrigued by a person, you can usually extract more information from them via the Tell Me About feature. Unfortunately, it's missing from the subsequent games. We need, like, Fallout at 2 but in reverse. A point for Fallout 1. Finally, I was getting worried. The patients get up to protect Jane from infidels, but they ain't much of a threat. Jane's bodyguard, however, is. Tycho has no problems gunning down unarmed civilians. That's the office of the water merchants. We can hire a caravan with supplies for Vault 13, extending the time limit, but I don't want the location of the vault to be discovered by the wrong people. You know what? We should upgrade our weapon. The best small gun in the game can be acquired via the quest given by this guy standing in the ruin near the Falcon. The job is to kill the raiders in the farmhouse. One of the bodies on the floor is Tycho. Yeah, rip. The reward is the 223 pistol, aka that gun from Vegas. In Fallout 1, it's a unique weapon. You can finish the game with it if you want. The final quest in the Decker chain is us ratting him out to the cops. This is a sophisticated encounter. Decker himself is a rare throwing knife user and is essentially harmless. But this guy, Kane, his second in command, might be the single most dangerous melee combatant in this entire campaign. My strategy for the fight is to shoot Kane in the leg to slow him down and then allow the cops and dog meat to soak up damage while I take pot shots from the safety of the back room. This eventually worked. Unfortunately, Kane tore apart dog meat with his bare hands. The sheriff got killed as well, but his assistant gives us the reward no problem. 115 days. Our best bet is Vault 12, located in the nearby ghoul city of Necropolis. The ghouls trade with humans, so the safest way of getting there is by working with one of the caravan companies here in the hub. Crimson Caravan pays the best. Listen, Walker, I don't do the deal with norms, so blowing smoke up the tail ain't gonna get you a seat at the table. Bakersfield, aka Necropolis, 105 days. The merchant says they're gonna be heading back to the hub in a few hours, but I don't think we'll be going with them. We do eventually find a group of peaceful ghouls who present us with the moral dilemma of Bakersfield. Yes, the locals are in possession of a computerized water purification system, but if we take their water chip, the community here will die. Unless we repair the town's water pump, creating an alternative way for them to get water. There'd better be a killer reason for standing in my shadow. 
does next on the menu ring a bell for you, Normie? I'm no Normie. I'm Schizo, PMC Hogtard. The mutants at the watershed need dirt naps. Makes my shadow grow. The plot lines converge on the water pump. The good guy ghouls want us to repair it. The bad guy ghouls want us to kill the mutants occupying it. And we want to recover the water chip from the vault accessible from this location. Order say, not ghoul, not be here. Well, I'll be leaving then. Oh, uh, okay. Have nice... Day. You know, maybe we should take this opportunity to learn more about the mutant community. Who is the master? I don't know, but think he like a boss people. What is the unity? The you 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 I don't know. This conversation provides an option to do one hell of a sequence break. We can ask Harry to take us to their leader, who is one of the two end game adversaries of Fallout, residing at a military base at the edge of the map. Mm, okay. Take it to Lou. Getting there takes more than a week of in-game time, but from the player's point of view it's instantaneous, which is a little jarring, feels like you are being teleported. It's a narrative design mistake. As the industry grew in size, more and more people were indoctrinated into the video gamer and the video game discourser lifestyles. The previous ideas were reductionist. You isolate a handful of qualities these games possess, and then you obsess over them. Narrative design was the opposite, it was about examining the game as a sum of its parts. Everything is important. And that sounds great. Finally, a foolproof theory to save RPGs. So one day, an upstart company called Obsidian releases a video game, Fallout New Vegas, based on Bethesda's hit franchise, Fallout. Narrative philosophers from the popular show Extra Credits subject the game to thinkery and analysis. And they are disappointed. New Vegas is not good enough. Actually, it's hard to identify the main idea in this mess of a script. Like, they keep asking for features the game already has. They seem to be under the impression that the protagonist of New Vegas has amnesia, which they don't. TLDR, basically they want the game to focus less on the world and more on the player. Be less like Morrowind and more like Skyrim. Or like the sensational game Fallout the Frontier. Wait, is this why the New Vegas mods are the way they are? YouTubers. That's the problem in a nutshell. The grand idea was fine, but a lot of these gamer philosophy enthusiasts lacked RPG-specific knowledge, and they kept trying to morph role-playing games into something Mass Effect-shaped. Shepard, you are the Reapers. I give it 85 out of 100 points. Oh, this is excellent. You know, I actually doubted my officers when they said they'd captured a prime normal. The lieutenant is a cybernetically enhanced super mutant intellectual in charge of the operations here at Mariposa. The super mutant is the next advancement in human evolution. To save the world, we will convert all the worthy individuals. That's the plot of the game. The pre-war scientists created a substance called FEV, forced evolutionary virus. The Unity manufactures super mutants by kidnapping humans and dipping them in FEV. But there is a problem. We are highly intelligent and The quality of mutations seem to depend on how irradiated the subject was. Common wastelanders make for suboptimal subs. Sometimes the process of transformation can even damage the intelligence of the subject, like it is the case with Harry. But individuals who were never exposed to radiation People who've never even seen the outside world. I can't have a perfectly good prime normal and not make it one of the chosen ones, now can I? After you tell me where your vault is. Interesting fact. Compounds that dramatically alter your body composition have existed IRL for a long time. And the lifestyle enthusiasts know that, well, the first question should always be, will my genitals still work after this is over? We shall see, won't we? That's not very reassuring, Lou. Our refusal to join the Unity is followed by a unique real-time combat sequence. We are not yet strong enough to kill the lieutenant, so we flee to fight another day. The Vats. This is where they make new mutants. The children of the cathedral serve as technicians, IT workers. They never actually confiscated our weapons, so... 
I'll be taking these robes, thank you very much. The control computer contains a private log of the man who created the Unity. Richard Gray led a small group of us up there. Harold is not a ghoul, by the way. He is an FEV mutant exposed to a smaller dose of the virus when they found this place many years ago. Richard Gray was a doctor. A doctor of philosophy, perhaps. Certainly not a medical doctor, as we'll eventually discover. In the log, Gray explains how exposure to extreme amounts of FEV gave him extraordinary powers, and how he experimented on various animals that wandered into the base, merging them together into abominations. Some of the mutant encounters can be avoided by wearing a disguise, but the guards at the exit seem to be permanently hostile. Whatever, the big pistol is more than good enough. The mutants at the base exterior have to be fought without cover, so I was forced to consume our entire drug stockpile, getting addicted to a bunch of stuff. Whatever, it's temporary. We have to warn our people of what we learned here. 84 days. Good. Ha! It's working! And it looks like we have a winner! Uh-uh. We don't have a winner just yet. We need to recover the chip first. An early Mariposa visit is entirely optional, but it is a fun detour. A quick pit stop at the hub to exchange our loot for skill books, and then back to Necropolis. <laughs> One or two mutants at the water pump have flamethrowers, but most are unarmed. The vault is accessible via the sewer. This place is more destroyed than Vault 15. All the machines are dead, with the convenient exception of the water processing control computer. And here it is, our salvation. Since the water pump was repaired, the ghouls of Necropolis should be fine, even without the chip. Well done. You've earned my sight, Walker. Hey, Seth, what do you know about the Master? His meaning has no place here. None. And the Unity? Misguided ideals. Nothing to my sight. Nothing at all. The story of the Bakersfield Ghouls is continued in the fan game Fallout Dayglow, which is very good. Let's go home. We arrive with two months to spare. Fallout 1 ends after both super bosses are dead. Finding the water chip is not a requirement for finishing the game, but getting rid of the time limit is nice. Vault 13, the closest thing we have to a pre-war society, and oh my god is it boring. You spend some time on the interweb doing nothing of importance. The outside world is your teacher now. And that's command and control. The overseer has two miniguns hidden in that thing. I don't really understand it, but it looks like someone's generating new mutants. Did you read my report? The Mariposa installation was converted to a mutant production facility. Find and destroy this lab. The game doesn't know how to react to our sequence break. Whatever. He's not the only one who is confused. Now, I'm gonna say something controversial. The way we build the monocled Krapager Academia of the future is by talking about the definition of RPG. This conversation has a bad rap. If you ask an enthusiast to define RPG, they'll usually just end up producing a list of features of role-playing games that are of importance to them personally. Some say that such definitions are incomplete and thus bad. I disagree. If you pay attention to these conversations, you'll notice that certain ideas tend to repeat over and over again. Choices and consequences keep getting reinvented. People just like forking the story by clicking dialogue options. The systems theory goes out of favor and then comes back every few years. Systems? No thanks, says the YouTuber, enlightened by his intelligence. Roleplay is about exploring an identity in social context. Well, actually, says an RPG lore beer, for the first two decades of their history, Arpagers were fairly simple tactical games and they sure weren't interested in exploring social anything. Take a step back and you can see the general outline of what the tree of ideas of the future discipline might look like. And uh, you might also notice that none of these theories do a good job of describing Fallout. 
The classic scene has been dead for a long time. Studios failed to reanimate it. Kickstarter failed to reanimate it. Indie developers failed to reanimate it. The medium was brought back by modders from the classic Fallout community. One of the most important figures is an individual from Siberia who I don't think even knows English. Which means that he didn't even read the blog of the industry veteran Jeff Fogel, who clearly says right here that art is slippery, and that the firmer you grasp, the sooner it slips out of your hands. So this unwashed hillbilly writes a design document that opens with a philosophy section where he outlines key ideas. Informed by these ideas, he then goes on to make a badass game, and then he does it again and again. What are you doing? Don't you even know that genres are marketing terms? This is embarrassing. One out of ten. Learn philosophy. Anyways, where were we? Ah, so before confronting the endgame threat, we should acquire an endgame weapon. This place is high tech. There's things inside like you've never seen before. Oh, uh, it's also radioactive. <laughs> Everyone in the Wasteland knows about the Brotherhood, but nobody seems to know what the Brotherhood is. Few are allowed inside the bunker. Obviously, they possess advanced technology, and they're called the Brotherhood, so perhaps they can offer us fraternal assistance. Uh, well, I, I talked to the High Elder, and he said that not just anyone can join. He uh, said you have to complete a quest first. We are to travel to a dungeon at the edge of the world, brave the dangers, and bring back proof that we've been there. On our way to the Glow, we stop by the cathedral, a majestic structure in the ruins of L.A. The presence of Gothic elements suggests we're dealing with something pre-war, something old and evil. These people have a secret, but we are here for something else. The monks run a store, they sell anti-radiation supplies, and make sure you have a rope with you. Our actual destination is not far from the ruins of San Diego, which is not an explorable location in this game. Take anti-radiation drugs and use the rope to descend the crater. Westec was a defense contractor and a research corporation involved in the development of power armor and FEV. The holodisc found on the body of the Brotherhood troop speaks of the dangers of the glow, but it's mostly just vibes. The invisible killer that is radiation can be managed by drugs. The automated defenses won't come online until we turn the power on. The loot is fantastic. Combat armor, energy weapons, big guns. But in order to fully explore the facility, we do have to turn on the lights. This has an effect of activating a new type of threat. Combat robots. You deal with the robots by letting them surround you and throwing a pulse grenade at point blank. This requires no skill point investment, and this type of a weapon doesn't damage humans. Another holodisc found in the glow contains a reference to the Burrows, a community of sentient raccoons, products of West Tech FEV experimentation. I felt that its content was not appropriate to our Fallout universe, mainly based on its style and feel in the game and not on its artistic merit, so I did not approve its addition to the game, says Team Kane. Real people, real problems. We got what we came here for. Well, that was when my granddad, Roger Maxson, led his soldiers here and started the Brotherhood. This is our home now. The Brotherhood Bunker turns out to be one of the biggest towns in the game. There are just as many talking heads as in the hub. My only complaint is that this place is visually bland, but it has to be, I guess. The medical lab. We can perform surgeries to increase our main stats. This is well worth doing and surprisingly not too expensive. It'll take you multiple weeks to recover from the surgeries, so you better have the water chip quest done. That's our bunkmate. Are we a knight or a scribe? Hmm. All the mutants I've studied have been sterile. They can't breed with another creature. You see what I mean? If Richard Gray had a PhD in sports science, the plot of this game would have never happened. In any case, now that the location of the Vats of Goo is known to us, we should strike first, before the mutant numbers grow out of control. Not a bad plan. Tell you what, let me go try and beat it into the Elders. The Elders place a unit of three paladins under our command. That's more help than anyone else has given us. 
The paladins are armed with heavy weapons and are helpful against the mutants guarding the exterior, whom we have already killed. In an early version of the game, they will also follow you inside and help deal with the interior guards, but this doesn't seem to happen in the Steam Fallout 1. Swing and a miss. You are so bad at this. Wow, maybe the mutant IQ is a bigger problem than I thought. The lieutenant is armed with a Gatling laser, one of the most powerful weapons in Fallout 1. We get a lucky crit that renders him unconscious. It also must have given Lou brain damage, cause he no longer remembers that we met. You know, I actually doubted my officers when they said they'd captured a prime normal. I said, I'm not a normie, I'm schizo, die! <laughs> A Tarantino-esque culture violent chapter finale. Going back to the Fallout 1 vs Fallout 2 debate, another argument in favor of the first game is that the developers clearly put extra effort into making combat encounters interesting. Gizmo, Kane, Jane… But I wouldn't necessarily say it's better than the sequel. Fallout 2 had something the first game lacked, and that is the tendency for spontaneous mass-scale violence. It's when you start a firefight in a casino, and then a stray bullet hits a passerby, and then an army of prostitutes join the battle, and then in the end the population of the city shrinks by 60%. You know what? Both games get a point for having excellent, underrated combat. The computer in the operations room can be used to trigger the self-destruct. Yes, it was possible to do this the first time we visited, but I was afraid it might somehow break the overseer's dialogue. We did it, guys. We are a team. Semper Fi. Are we a knight or a scribe? What if I want to be an elder? I'm thinking about going into politics. It is with a heavy heart that I must announce that not only are video games art, that by itself would have been manageable, but the classic role-playing games specifically are our equivalent of high art. And the signs are everywhere. People seem to believe that these old games are imbued with their current day political values. All the time I get comments that imply that the classic fallouts possess some sort of a puritanical anti-sex ideology. Which is quite a take, because the next most horny game after Baldur's Gate 3 is Fallout 2. Crapogers are high art because people appreciate them from a distance. Nobody plays them. These games are art because folks get emotional and irrational in their presence. Art is valuable. If you understand art, you are valuable for this society we live in. Excuse me. What? Yes? Who is this? I see. Yes. Instructions received, Mr. President. Cleave. We've seen Morpheus and the Nightkin, and they don't look like peacemakers to us. The city of Los Angeles must have been the largest in the world before the war. The Angel's Boneyard stretched forever, the skeletons of buildings lying under the hot sun. The Fallout manual is once again being poetic. The Boneyard is located fairly close to the hub, and there is nothing preventing you from visiting this location earlier. The community is quite big. What do they eat? Well, uh, whatever this is. Mushrooms? In the heart of the city, there is a great library. Look, people here fall in one of three categories. Rapists, murderers, or thieves. I'm a thief, says Katya, and joins us as a companion. They claim to want peace like us, but anyone who disagrees with them just disappears. Their dark god is not what he seems. The followers of the apocalypse are the ideological enemies of the children of the cathedral. A number of our spies have seen Nightkin coming in and out of the back room of the children's temple. Something important is back there. Downstairs, among the shelves in the followers' library, we meet another Vault Dweller from Vault 13. Talios was on a similar journey as us. Sent out into the wasteland in search for a water chip. Discovered the ghoul community in Necropolis. Fought the super mutant garrison. Was captured. Taken to Lu. But something went wrong during his transformation. Or maybe something went right. He was rescued by the followers. Talius never became a full soup. Instead, he is a ghoul like mutant, similar to Harold. The Gun Runners. Used to be a gang, now they operate an industrial plant, make weapons. They task us with removing the Deathclaw threat from LA. 
Our pistol is just barely adequate. Unfortunately, this is where Katya departs from Team Vault Dweller. If you talk to her corpse, it'll warn you of the dangers of death claws. Paranormal. That's it! There are four death claws in this entire game, unless you get a rare random encounter around the hub. The gun runners are impressed. Alright, time to get serious. I put a bunch of skill points I've been saving into energy weapons, buy a plasma rifle from the gun runners, and then go to Smitty from the Boneyard, who upgrades it to Turbo Plasma Rifle, the best damage per action point weapon in the game, with the exception of the Easter egg gun found in a rare special encounter. There are three ways of getting power armor. The easiest way is to go back to the hub, rescue a brotherhood troop kidnapped by the gangsters, and then ask the Quartermaster for power armor as reward. End game weapon, end game armor. All right, let's go meet Richard. The Nightkin came to us a while ago. They might be hideous mutants, but they are extremely loyal to the children, as we all are. The majestic cathedral building is the seat of power for Morpheus, the leader of the children. And below the church is the Los Angeles Vault, Master's headquarters. You should see Morpheus, the high priest. I'm sure he can help you much more than I. Laura is a spy for the followers. Oh, those are dreadful people. I'm not going to talk about them at all. I've read that it's possible to get the followers to support the cathedral assault in the same way the paladins support the attack on the military base, but I've never been able to trigger it. Nightkin? I don't know what you're talking about. The Nightkin are elite super mutants equipped with permanently active stealth devices. This doesn't seem to have any mechanical effect whatsoever. I guess that gives them a spooky aesthetic? That matters, right? I love when the game simply never stops introducing new ideas. Seems like one of the secrets of a good story. The unity is our search for a higher level of life and unity with our fellow man. Unlike the Master, Morpheus is an L.A. local, now serving as the public face of unity. So you are the vault dweller I've been hearing about. Surprised? I have my sources. Now I will take you as a gift to the Master. This is another shortcut. It's possible to skip a bunch of areas and go straight to the Master. But I see no reason to take shortcuts anymore. The Nightkin are tough and all, but the combination of a turbo plasma rifle and power armor makes us an apex predator. The entrance to the LA vault is concealed behind a fake wall. Floaters and centaurs, masters, pets and experiments. It's possible to meet them in the desert around the military base, but the only guaranteed encounter is right here, below the cathedral. That's a pleasantly clean vault isn't it? Ah, but I take that back. The lower levels are covered in previously unseen biomass, which is either a conduit for master's psychic powers or an independent living creature capable of invading the minds of the unprepared. The walls are alive with those who have gone before. We persuade one of the victims of experimentation to give us his psychic nullifier, removing the final obstacle between ourselves and the master. The unity will bring about the master race. Master. Master. One able to survive or even thrive in the wasteland. It is, of course, possible to solve the master problem in a non-violent way by presenting Vree's evidence that mutants can't reproduce, but I don't like doing that because it robs us of a fight with a unique enemy and a Tarantino animation. Mutants are best equipped to deal with the world today. Who else? The ghouls? Please. Normals! Careful, Richard. As long as there are differences, we will... Tear ourselves apart! Fighting each other. We need one race. Race! Race! One goal. Goal! Goal! One people. Do you get it? It's called having a theme. The game opens with war never changes, and then we travel around California and find people at war with each other and themselves. Finally, we meet the antagonist and he is like, I'm gonna stop all war. But in order to stop war, he needs to wage war. Hypocritical much? Anyway, that's the point of the story. Or is it? 
All YouTubers have a paranormal ability to extract profound truths about society, capitalism, and invisible structures of power seemingly from any piece of media. It is as if there is a vat somewhere that manufactures this type of person. And indeed there is. It's on the island of Patmos in Greece. Some individuals, brainwashed by years of exposure to YouTube, think that this is what media criticism is. But no, it's just the albino mutation talking. It's a way of doing things. And for our purpose, says it's not even good. In a game like Fallout, the job of the designer is to provide you the tools to assemble the story with, and theming, applied to individual bits and pieces, doesn't determine the meaning of that story. That is up to you to decide. Or perhaps it's not even useful to focus on meaning. Perhaps we should understand Fallout in the same way we understand another person, in the same way we understand a friend. This is an awkward time to be sharing this, but I'm something of a believer in the unity. The organization has a lot to offer to mankind, and every problem with it is solvable. Look how filthy this environment is. I bet you can reduce the percentage of adverse side effects simply by vacuuming the place. Get a Roomba. Sterilization? That sucks. But what if we only converted individuals who already had kids? And look how crude is the procedure. What if we lower the dosages? What if instead of super mutants we made, uh, intermediate mutants? You know, get some benefits of mutation, but without the sides. It took a lot of time and labor to build this organization. Unity could have been the Bene Gesserit of California. But that's not the point of the story, is it? War never changes, but people do. Can never thank you enough for what you've done. You've saved all our lives. That makes the rest of this even harder. You can never go home again. The Overseer character wasn't given a name. The voice actor is Kenneth Mars. Everyone will want to talk to you. Every youngster will look up to you and want to emulate you. They'll want to leave. What happens to the vault if we lose the best of a generation? Hey, Kenny! It's like I said, human body is 60% water. Now we travel north, to Hyperborea, away from the Nephilim miscreants. I'll build my own vault, spread the Neanderthal seed, and just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Alright, patron credits and then we'll finish the debate about what is better, Fallout 1 or Fallout 2. Give me all your money via the crowdfunding platform Patreon, do it now. These videos are funded by enthusiasts, including Jim Lawrence, Danny Kilpatrick, Frog, Darkbot Pumpkin, Billy Strayhorn, Yuri Solodovnichenko, Eric Luitkehans. My next video will be on I Divine Cybermancy, I Feed My Parrot Chicken, Ilya Rubin, Maciej. 1967 Ford Mustang, Source is the best engine ever made, Tony Spagoni, Ganzo Bomb and Motherfucker, Miracle Moses Porter, Azazel and Baneful the Doggo, A Two Room Apartment in Babrusk Belarus Alt, C6, Snafu, Ray Nurse, Gang Warfare Enthusiast, Dmitri Yu, Buck Swope, and Serpen. So, we don't talk nearly enough about this. Art works by making you feel things. That's a fairly uncontroversial statement. As you experience more arpagers and crapagers, your tastes become more and more sophisticated, and you require an ever greater degree of stimulation to feel anything. I could never get into Oblivion and Fallout 3, because these felt like they were designed to be somebody's first RPGs. Eventually, I lost the ability to enjoy the early Infinity Engine games, and then then I discovered that Gothic 1 doesn't do it anymore. And oh my god, it's your turn, isn't it? Yes, I guess you could say I know stuff. When exploring the Boneyard, I caught myself thinking that if this was a fan game, LA would probably have had a unique tile set, and the mapping of Shady Sands would have been much better. And Junktown. Junktown is the blandest of ethical problems. Neither character believes in much of anything. It's like something out of Fallout th No. No, 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 wait a minute. Fallout 1 versus the sequel. Let's talk visuals. What makes the classics feel dated is the UI. The sprite work itself is great, especially in the original Fallout. They added new sprites in Fallout 2, but the quality is mixed. Some of them are just as good, others look like they were ripped from another game. Fallout 1 takes this. 
Now, the music. Going into this, I didn't realize how many of my favorite tracks are actually from the sequel. I never really thought about it, I guess. The NCR theme, the Reno theme, the Vault City music. There is variety, and uh, the Fallout 2 tracks have stronger individual identities. An easy win for the sequel. A close race. The next category is thematic consistency. An important quality in a game with an open structure, because this is how you make the adventure feel like a coherent story instead of a series of disconnected anecdotes. Fallout 1 obviously takes this. No talking animals, no gangster city, no Scientology. God damn, I don't want this end in a tie. Look, real talk. It's like this. If you value classic Fallout as a storytelling machine, Fallout 2 is a better game, by virtue of it being bigger and having more ideas, more builds, more pieces for you to assemble a story with. It has flaws, but so does the first game. Fallout 2 wins, Slava. But I am not your boss. Perhaps you have your own ritual of engaging with this medium. Like maybe you happen to value extreme concision. And this entire playthrough, all the adventures we had, from seeing the outside world for the first time to blowing up the master, it all took me 10 hours. Followed by four weeks of writing and editing. Anyway. Take it easy. Remember to stay hydrated. See you in Vegas. If you own a physical copy of Fallout 1, please dispose of it now, as every Fallout 1 box will detonate in 3, 2, 1.